And we are live. We have participants with us now. Hello, everybody. We will wait uh, some minutes uh, in order to wait the uh, participants to join us to this Scale Up Champion webinar series. Uh, as you know, the Scale Up is a project, a European project, that we are joining different parts, science and technology parts of all Europe, promoting the scale ups, uh, promoting the uh, not only how to start up, is how to create the path to growth for companies that are growing across Europe and across the world. Uh, the idea of this uh, webinar today is to talk a little more, uh, to uh, understand how really the scale ups are growing, in this case, in the south of Europe. We'll wait some minutes in order to join uh, different participants that they uh, send the message that they will be with us. And yes, uh, it's, uh, we are on time, we can start, but let's put one minute in order to wait all uh, the people that is joining us. Uh, the title of this uh, webinar is Expanding Your Business to South of Europe. Uh, here we will see how we are expanding our business wherever you are, but uh, how you can really expand your business in South of Europe. Understanding South of Europe, uh, all the company, all the countries that are uh, put South of Europe where, wherever you find that is starting Europe, uh, the South of Europe. Uh, we know that the South of Europe is starting Mediterranean, that you can go start grow 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 and you can put Paris, and you can go a little more. Uh, but in any case, uh, the idea is that wherever you are, grow. Uh, and the best way to grow uh, is really uh, to expand your business in all Europe. Good. Uh, we pass one minute, and I feel that this is enough time for starting this uh, dialogue. We have one hour of dialogue with three speakers, the speakers that we were choosing, understanding that we needed in this mix of today, uh, the different, let me tell you, I'm sorry, uh, speakers, uh, we needed uh, to share with you different animals of our ecosystem, animals in terms of what? When I was doing a big research about ecosystems of innovation in Silicon Valley, uh, following the guidelines of Professor Henry Etzko, the father of the triple helix, and also with Jerry Engel uh, from UC Berkeley, we understood that we needed in the ecosystem different animals, animals that are doing what? Are doing things, things like what? To be an entrepreneur, this is one. If we don't have entrepreneurs, it's very difficult to expand your business because we are not starting from scratch, from zero. That's the role of entrepreneurs. We needed in investors. In this case, uh, we were thinking how to invite investors in this uh, uh, dialogue, uh, joining us people uh, from the Business Angels Arena. And also we were thinking also in accelerators and at the end of the day ecosystems that are helping others to grow. Uh, for this reason, uh, today we have three speakers, Jacopo Loso, the Director of, of Secretariat at IBAN, the European Business Angel Network, uh, Xavi Capallada, CEO of Adnomo, but is a serial entrepreneur that uh, has created uh, near four or five startups, Xavi will explain to us, and Robert Marino, co-founder and director of Dig Tech Founders, an accelerator that is based in Paris. Uh, the dialogue will be open, and also I would like to remind you uh, that uh, we have opened the chat for all the uh, all the questions that you uh, want to uh, ask to the uh, speakers or to our program. But starting, uh, let me ask one by one that everyone uh, presents their self uh, and perhaps Jacobo, can you explain to us uh, what is your role in Ivan and also uh, your experience on the, all this sector? Well, good morning, Joseph. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for having me today for this discussion. Um, I represent the European Business Angels Network, IBAN, which is basically the trade association that's gathering uh, the business angel and early stage investor community here in Europe. So 
We are a trade body that uh, started about 20 or so years ago, and we represent mainly investor groups uh, made up by business angels across all of the continents. So we were a membership based organization with around 150 members, and it's covering basically the entire map of Europe, plus also some regions outside of Europe that look at this continent for good deal flow or, or even as a place to scale up, believe it or not. Um, the European Business Angels uh, Network tries to, of course, as a network, put uh, investors in touch with the ultimate goal of having them uh, share deals and invest together, ideally also in, in a cross-border way. And we do a lot of activities that go into that sense. Uh, we're also here to professionalize the angel investor category. Uh, so we give best practices and we teach to some extent how to be a good business angel investor and how to make the most uh, impact in your role uh, when working with startups. And there's a series of educational activities we do, as well as uh, activities that allow investors to share peer-to-peer -peer knowledge. Uh, as an entity in Brussels, we're here to advocate for uh, more support to entrepreneurs and to early stage investors. And as part of that work, we also get involved quite a bit in doing research and publications and papers on this market. So that's us in a nutshell. Uh, and then maybe I can get back to the role of the business angels in the second bit uh, when you come back to me. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Jacopo. We understand that you are the kind of animal that we needed today, uh, the, the investor uh, as a part of this ecosystem. Let's go to the second, sorry, animal, uh, a second person that, that for this ecosystem, uh, that in this case is an entrepreneur. Xavier Capellada, CEO at Domo. Can you explain to us what is your experience as an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur? Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Joseph, and the organization to, to invite me to, to try to share my thoughts uh, here all, all with you. As you said before, I think uh, uh, I'm a, a very special animal. I think that uh, my own auto definition is that I'm a, a, an expert in to try to manage uncertainty because I think that in all my background, I, I try to uh, create or build uh, new business or new companies uh, from scratch until to create a sustainable company. So uh, as you know, this is very difficult because you don't have historical data to uh, know which is the way that you have to follow. But uh, at the same time, it's the, the most challenge activity that you can, you can do. At this moment, I'm the CEO of uh, Nomo. Nomo, uh, it's a new challenger bank or real bank for freelancers and self-employed uh, people that uh, try to, or that allows uh, you uh, manage your business and manage uh, your taxes and try to offer them a very uh, customized uh, financial service. Uh, we are trying to redefine the definition of, of banking because, as you know, the, uh, the workforce in the global vision is changing and we think that we have a, a very huge opportunity. In that specific case, it's a, it's a, it's a different definition of a, a startup because we are creating a new hybrid model because we are an internal startup inside a big corporation that it's uh, Banco Sabadell. So I, I think that this is a evolution of uh, the traditional models of uh, startups or entrepreneurship because we have uh, the support of a big corporation that in this case is Banco Sabadell, but at the same time, we have uh, the world uh, freedom to operate and to try to change the uh, business core of the big corporation. I think that after we can discuss about the different models of entrepreneurship, but uh, I think that uh, this is an interesting model that uh, we are uh, iterating at, at this moment. So very open to discuss with all of you in the next... Uh, Thank you, Xavier, because you are the kind of animal that we love. Uh, Scale Up Champions is a program in Europe, it's a parade in Europe that is trying to help any startup to grow. And that's the reason why we say a scale up. It's not just a startup, a scale up. And you are the kind of animal that we love. But in any case, we love all of you, but in any case, especially the entrepreneurs. That's the reason why we are doing this. Okay, good. Let's go to the third participant, Robert Marino, co-founder and director of Deep Tech Founders. Robert, the floor is yours. 
Micro? Well, I can manage. Yeah, thanks for having me today. Uh, very happy to be here and, and share some insights. Um, so just a few words about Deep Tech Founders. Um, we created this uh, acceleration program two years ago with my co-founder, Xavier Duporte. Um, the initial idea was that, uh, so we are working with this very specific kind of companies, kind of startups, the ones that heavily rely on science, what we call Deep Tech, so companies in quantum computing, um, biotechnologies, new materials, uh, heavy transportation, some AI and things like that, because they have um, unique characteristics such as long development time. They need a lot of cash in order to be able to achieve product development. Um, so they, they have some specifics in their development. And, um, and one thing that we see is that most of the time the founders are, are people coming from science. So they are experts in their field, but uh, they lack some understanding in terms of business, in terms of uh, how to transform technologies into products and things like that. So we created a specific program for them. Um, and um, and the, the idea that, that, that we wanted that is really at the core of the program is that we did not want to um, develop something that would be, um, that could be given by a business school, but rather something that is hands on and, uh, and rely on, on, on sharing experience from people that do that develop companies to people that are willing to do and willing to develop companies. So the first thing we did was to create an ecosystem of about a hundred mentors. Uh, that all founded uh, all people with scientific or business background that created deep tech startups and grew them uh, from we have uh, companies that went through Series B, C, some uh, IPO their company, some IPO several companies who have uh, bought or some uh, uh, companies that have more than 20 years of experience. Um, so we have yeah, a network of about 100 people that come and share their experience um during six months with uh with batches of teams that are willing to see if they should start a company or we also have teams that started the company and come to prepare a seed round or series a <clears throat> um and to be better prepared for for these rounds um in two years we we helped 100 companies uh, 100 teams to go through the program um, we finished the first uh, batch in February 2019, so roughly a year ago. And the first 12 companies that has raised funds already raised over 30 million euros and, uh, and counting. So we hope that, uh, that we'll be able to multiply this by 10 um, in, in a couple of years. Um, and, um, and one thing also that is very interesting, so we, the program is uh, fully online. So we have teams coming from the entire country not only in Paris, but also from abroad. Um, we had team from the UK, from the US, and also from New Zealand. So <clears throat> uh, we helped one team from New Zealand to set up in, in France. Uh, so I'll be very happy to share some yeah. experience and feedbacks on how we help those teams understand the French ecosystem. And um, yeah, maybe one, one last detail about myself. So as you can see from my name, I'm both French and Italian. And grew up in Germany, so I can't say where is the limit between north and south, but I'll be happy to share my experience in, in these different countries. Perhaps you're a bridge, you're a bridge yeah. between both. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. Uh, we encourage all, everybody to make questions in the chat and also participations, and also we remind you that we have this uh, the website is scaleupchampions.com where you will find all the information about the program and how can we help you if you're a startup, but also companies or corporates that they want to connect with the startups as a, as a, a source of innovation. Xavier, let's go to a start. In the point of view of entrepreneur, what is your experience as a, as a sales entrepreneur? Uh, the best strategy to growth in terms of market, talent, technology, finance, and ecosystem. At the end of the day, the path to growth, what is the experience that you can really share and what is the best strategy? I think it's a really good question and I would like to have the, the right answer. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, when you are trying to uh, be an entrepreneur, the problem is that uh, you don't have the right answers. No? Uh, I think that uh, from my past experience, I think that perhaps the most important thing is that you have to fall in love with the problem, not fall in love with the solution or your technology. You have to understand very well which is the problem that uh, you want to solve. Uh, so you have to 
ask to your potential market, you have to ask your potential uh, customers, you have to ask your potential partners, etc. Because this is really, really uh, important because sometimes we are thinking that our solution or our technology is the best solution, but uh, uh, in, the, in, uh, in reality, we, are not, we, we don't understand the, the, the problem or the, 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 the solutions that we want to create. So I think this is very important because if you understand the problem after you can iterate and you can uh, do a different pivots or you can uh, manage your strategy. So for me, this is a, a key question that sometimes we are not solving uh, very well. And after of it, I think that this is very important to hire the best team uh, for your uh, new startup. Because at the end, this is a, a sports team. Uh, I, I understand that some people think that uh, you need a guru to uh, build the future, but this is not true. You need to build a really good team uh, around you if you want to scale up your, your startup. Very interesting because it means that if you understand the problem and not just one problem, the, a big problem with a lot of customers behind, uh, you will have a path to grow because the market will allow you to grow. Because at the end of the day, if there is a problem of one person, really there is no market, it's better not to waste time for anybody <laughs> and to look for a new a new problem. Absolutely. Good. Uh, Sorry, just, no. man, uh, okay. when you are understanding the, the problem, you can uh, quantify which is the volume of your market and if you... Uh, have the, the potential to scale, no? because sometimes we are trying to solve uh, specific problems, but uh, that are only affecting to uh, 100 people. So it, this is not a market where uh, you can build a, a new company. Okay, good. Robert, uh, Dexoretus take advantage of your experience and your network for supporting entrepreneurs and startups in order to help them how to grow in a very effective and fast way. What is the real value proposition that you provide uh, in, as accelerators in the ecosystem in connection with the rest of agents of the ecosystem? Um, that's, that's a very good question, actually, because uh, that's how we, we need to convince people to join us. Um, I would say that there are several things uh, that we provide to people that join the accelerators. Um, First thing, as we uh, rely on, on sharing of experience and real experience, I mean, something that comes from the film, from the fact that people went through the same problems and, and things like that, um, we, uh, we help teams uh, to avoid most of the common or even uncommon problems that, uh, that everyone will face and, and the challenge that everyone will face. Just because you know that they will happen, you doesn't mean you are ready to to face this challenge and that you will succeed, but at least you know it happens and you can start by, by mitigating risks and, and think about strategies. Um, second point that is actually very important also is um, they are not alone anymore. Mm. And uh, we, as, as I mentioned, we run batches that are in between 20 and 30 teams. So when, whenever there is a problem, there are within a batch, they can just ask anyone else and they see that everyone is facing the same problem as, they, as them. So it's better, in, even in terms of um, on psychological point of view, it's better when, when you can share your problems with, with other people and they have a lot of problems to, to share. Uh, they are also within a network of alumni. So as I mentioned, we have around 100, 100 teams now and, and this network can provide guidance, feedbacks, expertise, I mean, many different things um, that, um, that will um, help and also some, some uh, advice tips on who to work with. For instance, you are looking for a supplier. They know because they work with this supplier that they, it's a supplier of trust and things like that. So uh, this is really what, what we try to bring to, um, to uh, the alumni also being, being part of a network. The other thing that once you're part of a network, you're not alone and you're part of something bigger than yourself. And, uh, and that's also very important. For instance, when you have to negotiate or to get access to some specific fundings or negotiate with funds, for instance, or business angels. Um, because there were people before you and there will be people after you, they tend to first have a better interaction with you. For instance, we call funds and we say, you should meet with this team. So they have a quite easily uh, 
uh, a meeting with the fund and then the fund will be more akin to um, to coach the team and to give feedbacks and not to enter into due diligence uh, uh, at all or they will also uh, accept that the teams can improve and things like that so because they know that the teams are valuable um, and then of course we um, we also provide uh, some I mean guidance and feedback so coaching to the teams so we help them uh, take a step back and reflect on what they would they will do during six months and um, and help them in many different ways uh, to improve their business model and things like that we can also as i mentioned being part of a network is something bigger do introduction also to corporate partners um, and uh, and help them understand the global ecosystem in which they are especially for okay. foreign teams um, and how to interact with uh, public bodies and things like that but maybe we can yeah discuss that a bit later okay very very interesting because i mean that you know the day you are a connector with the ecosystem completely and not yeah. only the experience that you connect with uh, like the science park and uh, yeah. we connect locally and and globally jacob jacopo uh, in order to fulfill the ecosystem we need money from the beginning from the beginning of uh, in order to help the startups business angels venture capital and corporate venturing are the path to growth in terms of investment what is the important role of the business angel as the first investor that uh, is not your father, your mother, or your friend? Yeah, thanks for the question, Josep. Um, well, let me define, first of all, this, this animal that we're talking <laughs> about today, the, the business angel. So um, it, it is a private investor. I think that's the first important thing to say. So it's, a, it's an individual, private individual that is acting as a professional investor. Uh, and they're investing, obviously, their own personal savings that they've usually accumulated in, in time by, ha by being a serial entrepreneur also in a previous lifetime. That's actually the typical profile mm -hmm. of an angel. So they come from an entrepreneur background. Usually they've exited as an entrepreneur their venture some time ago, and now they are basically reinvesting in the next generation of, of founders. Um, whenever they are not an, a serial entrepreneur, often they are somebody that has a very high level corporate background. So a long career in, in maybe a big company and now in retirement, they're again, supporting the growth of, of other founders. Um, and they're not just supporting the growth with capital. I think that's usually if you ask any business angel, you know, what do you contribute? They, they leave the capital part for last because they put it last in the order of the importance of what they contribute. Actually, the other two big things that are being contributed are the experience and the background on how to build a company. And that is valuable knowledge. And, and that knowledge is usually conveyed through advice, through mentoring, even moral support, decision-making support. Um, and the second bit is, is actually the network connections that those individuals as angels have. And those network connections can be with clients. They can be with talent. They can be mm -hmm. with other sources of capital. And those two elements coupled with the finance are really, really crucial for an entrepreneur that is taking their first steps. Because obviously when you're building a company and you're not yet ready uh, with your product in the market, so your, your, your company is not yet selling anything. It's often when a business angel comes across a startup, they're, they're still at a level where they're not yet in the market with the with, uh, their, their product or service. They've, they've probably made a prototype. They've probably gotten a little bit of validation from the supposed market they will launch in, but, but they usually uh, have not yet gotten there. So the angel is there to make that step into the market go as smoothly as possible. And there's a lot that can go wrong. And, and, and that been there, done that background helps avoid to make some mistakes. And, and, and fundamentally, also, the network connections helps uh, more the success in the first days of, of operations of a business. So that is really the huge contribution they provide. And that's why they're called smart capital. Um, and then the second you know, common definition that, that the market gives to the angels is that they, they tend to be a bit more patient uh, than other investors. Now, that is actually due very much to the fact that, as I said before, the angels are investing their own wealth in the startup. So unlike other types of investors that have to report to limited partners, to shareholders, or to somebody else, the angels usually just have to report back to themselves, which means that 
they are a little bit less anxious to monetize quickly on the investments. And so they're a little bit easier to work with if you're a founder as opposed to other investors because they're not usually not going to be pushing you uh, to do a quick return on, on, on your activity. So I would say that those different uh, things that I mentioned about the capital, the mentoring and the network, coupled with the fact that there is also a lot more patience in, 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 from this investor, uh, do a lot of, uh, do help a lot of the entrepreneur. Uh, very interesting, very good, because with your uh, view, you really promote and provide the experience of the serial entrepreneurs as a rain investors. That's very interesting. And also you provide this uh, element of not only money, experience with investor. That's very, very important. Good. Uh, Xavier, uh, listening Jacob, what are you expecting from a business angel? Because you are an entrepreneur, but you have in front of you an investor, uh, in this case, a business angel. What you are expecting? Yes, let me let me start uh, a dialogue between animals. What are you expecting from the other part of the ecosystem that is investor? Uh, it's a really good question about uh, what we are expecting from the perspective of entrepreneurs. Uh, I think that uh, obviously we we want uh, smart capital, okay? But uh, what it does means for me is uh, smart capital. Uh, so for me, first of all, I think that uh, I want uh, capital or money that uh, clearly it's not the most important thing, but for me, it's uh, an example of commitment of the investor uh, in the project. Because uh, honestly, I, uh, let me be, uh, be it uh, provocative. I want to avoid the consulting profile that is trying to help uh, the startup, but uh, without commitment and without uh, to understand the, the the life that we are uh, living inside of the, of the startup. So first of all, you have to put uh, money, and this is not most, the most important thing. But after, I'm looking for uh, experience or expertise. I think that it's really important that uh, you are looking for a business angel that understand your market and your product. Because uh, obviously uh, you can uh, have a broad experience in different markets, but if you don't understand and you can help me to try to be disruptive in that market, I don't know if you can help uh, to scale up that company. And uh, in connection with this, the third element that uh, I'm expecting uh, from a business angel is the networking, the capacity to uh, connect with different other uh, venture capitals, business angels, uh, other parts of the ecosystem to scale up the company. Uh, so I think that this is really important. And I think that in, in base of my experience, perhaps a good business angel for uh, uh, one company, it's not a good profile for other company. So you, know, this, uh, you have to try, you have to uh, try to manage this expectation in function of the market or the ambition that you have with your, with your company. Very, very interesting because it means that when you connect with an investor, a business angel, they have also networks of other kind of investors or second rounds or series A or B, it sure. means more people on that. Uh, Jacob, uh, what are you expecting from a startup? Yeah. Uh, you, you know what Xavier is expecting from you, but uh, and you? Xavier is expecting exactly what, what he should expect from a business angel. Um, so now on, on the side of the investor, I, I always, I, I myself, I'm not an investor, but we deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's say that what we know from the investors is that they're looking for a few things. The underlining element that the, the basis is the passion that the entrepreneur has for the problem they are trying to solve. And that passion is something that is actually fundamental because the scale-up journey is going to be a long one, probably a roller coaster ride with a lots of ups and downs. So having passion and usually passion and determination tend to go hand in hand will help in the long run. Uh, for that team to, to 
go over the barriers and hurdles. So that is something that all investors want to see in the founders that speak, that they speak to is that passion for what they are doing. The second is, is something that was mentioned before, the market. The market needs to be sizable, large enough to allow for a possible return on the investments that I, as an angel, I'm going to make. And of course, angels at the end of the day are in the business of making a return on their investment. So they're hoping to invest in a company that will grow in a market that is large enough to, to make a possible good uh, revenue uh, on an annual basis. And, and that usually also goes hand in hand with the problem the entrepreneurs are trying to solve. So usually big problems tend to have also sizable markets that go along with them. And then the third is, is really the team, the people in the company and their mix of skills and how their competences uh, are, are, are complementary to each other, but also sufficient in, in terms of bringing about the vision that the, that the startup has. And then some uh, uh, investors are usually looking for what they call the unfair competitive advantage that that startup has. And a lot of the times they use this term unfair, meaning that, which, which means what makes you very unique, the, the only company in the world that can do it this way. So they are looking for companies that have something extremely unique and that can be the differentiating factor that sets them apart from the rest of the competition and, and gives them the competitive edge for a sustainable business. So it's it's that mix of four. Okay, good, very good, Jacob. It means that you can be uh, animals, that you can be marriage, uh, where <laughs> you can join because you can understand. I, I would say know. just last last note from from me, and I think uh, Xavier was was getting to that. Uh, not every angel is right for you. So as an entrepreneur and to the entrepreneurs in the audience, you know, the angels always do due diligence on you to make sure your startup is, is exactly what it is. You should do the same for the angels. You should do due diligence on the angels that approach you or that you approach. And you should basically figure out how they operate with the other companies that they claim to have invested in. So give them a round of calls to the other founders and try to do some digging around the people that are sitting across the table from you that call themselves mm -hmm. business angels. So that would That's be my- very, very interesting in terms of reputation, experience, and, and how they were managing this investment. Good, let's go to now to open, Xavier and Robert, uh, a dialogue between you because uh, the dialogue between entrepreneur and accelerator is also one thing that we can really expect. Xavier, what are you expecting as entrepreneur or thinking about entrepreneurs uh, in relation with an accelerator, why you will join an accelerator? When uh, what, what, and, and uh, how really uh, you do you think that uh, an accelerator can provide value? At the end of the day, what are you expecting from the accelerator? I think that following the last comment of Jacopo, uh, I think that uh, in the same line, uh, not all the accelerators are for your startup. Uh, in my case, I, I really like that accelerators that have some uh, vertical expertise. No? I think that um, the global or, generated, or generic accelerators perhaps it's useful if you are a very young entrepreneur, but if you have very clear your market and the problem that you want to solve and your ambition is to scale up, I think that it's very important to choose that accelerator that uh, have some expertise or experience in the vertical or market that uh, you want to, to achieve. So I think for me, this is the, the, the first thing that I want to check when I have to validate uh, if it's interesting for me or for my startup to join uh, to an accelerator. And after, obviously, uh, which is the experience that have that accelerator uh, to uh, help to my startup to be more efficient or productive, no? Because at the end, uh, we are very focused, uh, focused in our uh, solution, uh, if we have cleared our problem, but you have to create uh, the, the the machine of uh, all your, all your operations. So you need uh, help in sales, in marketing, in uh, a lot of things. That if you uh, have uh, like a partner, a good accelerator, they can help a lot of you to uh, to learn and to grow uh, very fast. Very good, uh, Robert. And what are you expecting from entrepreneurs? Are you selecting entrepreneurs, I suppose? But in any case, 
what kind of entrepreneurs you want to join with your uh, accelerator? And also, in what way you connect with business angels? When you connect with them, in order to connect with the rest of animals of this ecosystem? Um, yeah, just, just I mean, uh, we had very good feedback from from Xavier and, and, and Jacopo at, at the beginning. So, uh, to elaborate on what they just said, um, there is one thing that we often say to the people that join and that to take part in the program is, um, uh, it's okay to be wrong. It will happen all the time. But, uh, but you can't be unprepared. So whatever you do, you have to be prepared. And as much as you have to perform a due diligence on business angel that you, will, uh, that you would like to, to have on, 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 your, on your board, you also need to do your due diligence on the accelerators, incubators, whatever you want to join. Um, because um, one thing that is key when you are running a startup is, is time. Uh, money, you can find money. It, I mean, clearly now there is money everywhere and you can find money to, to fuel a company. But time is something that you, can, you can't find and uh, you can't buy. If you lose time, it's, it's lost forever. Um, so clearly when you apply to an accelerator, please just read what they provide, what kind of services they are, they are providing, at which stage they, they work with companies. Uh, is it pre-incorporation? Is it uh, is it pre-series A? Is it pre-revenues or whatever? Because uh, you can't do everything. Uh, accelerators. The idea is that you come and you go faster and you avoid mistakes that you would do without the accelerator. So it has to be during a limited amount of time. And uh, and therefore, even for an accelerator, having someone that is not at the right place is not the best thing. So. First thing first is make sure that uh, when you apply for something, you go there because it fulfills the needs that you have currently um, because you can't afford to lose time. Then we want people that are really committed also because um, uh, it's a short amount of time and we will open doors to many other people. So we'll introduce them. And once we introduce someone, we vet them. So we want to be sure that uh, that they are at the... At the um, uh, Okay, uh, that they are also at the level of of of, um, of uh, quality that that you expect uh, to be, um, and then uh, so the question about how do we link them with uh, business angels or also other investors because uh, because now we have uh, also professional investors that do pre seed or early stage funding. Um, first thing first, that is most important probably we do a due diligence on the business angels that we work with and the funds and we want to and we do the, yeah, a lot of work in order to understand what their investment thesis is what kind of of companies they are looking for what's the size of their investment um if it's a fund at which stage of the fund it is are they in uh, fundraising and themselves are they in uh, investment part are they in divesting closing or whatever uh, because you can't expect the same thing from the people that invest and then once we we understand what's the I mean how angels or investors um, do invest and and, uh, and, and, uh, and interact with companies, then we will select the companies that fits these needs and uh, and also of course understand the needs of the company and then do the matching and help and, and things like that. One thing also that we like to do is that the first meeting is never um, it's it's just a, it's just a meeting. It's for both of them to know each other. And uh, see if if there is a fit in terms of mentality, in terms of vision, in, and so on. It's it's never about money, because um, as men, uh, I mean, it was mentioned many times before. Um, what it's someone that will be with you for a very long time. Uh, more than I think, relationship with an investor lasts longer than marriage. So you'd better be sure that the person you are going to work with uh, is the one you want to have on board. So first meeting is always about knowing each other. Then if there is a fit, let's go into due diligence and, and things like that. So that's how we, we help yeah. them understand. And work Very good. With good. Uh, Jacopo, um, do you have connections with uh, accelerators in the San Saints part and other ecosystems to connect with the deal flow? And what are you expecting from them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Iban, uh, when we started off many years ago, we were only gathering business angel investors in our network today we actually have also a nice amount of equity accelerators and and business incubator uh, networks and centers and the reason is that this value chain of entrepreneurship 
works better when it's connected and when there are interconnections between the various actors because we are all here doing almost the same thing. We're trying to support the startups in growing and scaling. So the angels and the accelerators have actually uh, usually a very good relationship because as you correctly mentioned, it, they are a good source of deal flow for the, for the investors and, and for the investor group. So angels typically find security in numbers like many animals in the savannah. So they invest mm -hmm. together. So they usually invest together and they set up a club and that club usually receives deal flow from various sources, but but usually also from the from the closest equity accelerators that are in town. Um, what I'm expecting from from them as an investor, we're obviously they are taking companies and trying to do what normally is done in a few years and in, in, in just a few months. So so I'm expecting that there is a result at the end, which is which is basically the startup is ready to receive investment. So they're taking a company in most cases that is just an idea. And now they're doing all that is needed to make sure that this is not anymore an idea. This is a business that can receive private funding to continue to grow. So that is what I, the number one thing I'm expecting. And to get there, obviously, you need within the accelerator to have a good mix of mentors, of people that can do proper mentoring and with the right experience from an entrepreneurial, personal entrepreneurial background. So that is something I'm, I'm expecting from a good accelerator. I'm also expecting them to be in contact with the corporate world that they are uh, linked to. So usually accelerators pick a sector. Sometimes they pick a, a technology. But, but that relation with the corporates that are in this industry is fundamental because that type of business interaction is what allows startups to build a reputation that can then help attract funding, help attract other clients, and ultimately scale. We call them the transformational deals that need to happen between a small company and a big corporation. And then ultimately, I'm expecting that accelerator to be in contact with as many as possible of the local investor networks that are around okay. them. So those three. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting because now uh, we, more or less, we know what is the role of every animal and what you are expecting from uh, each other. But let's go to connect uh, with the, uh, the goal also of this uh, meeting, of this webinar that is talking about South of Europe. In your experience, what difference are in the South of Europe in front of other ecosystems, the North of Europe or perhaps London or Silicon Valley? But in any case, what difference in terms of investment, creator, entrepreneur, or difficulties that we have in the south of Europe in front of other regions, language or whatever. We can start perhaps with Robert. Um, well, I would say that, um, and, and at this stage, I would speak mostly about France because that's probably the ecosystem I know best. Um, in, uh, if, if we draw a comparison with, for instance, uh, London, I mean, the UK and Paris versus London and Paris versus Berlin, um, I think last year, Paris stopped number one in terms of new companies and number two in terms of early stage funding, so like 5 billion euros and only second to London. So the amount of cash of startups that have been created in France is now yeah, quite impressive. Of course, we are far be uh, behind uh, Silicon Valley, but uh, in, in Silicon Valley is becoming so big that now there is North the Silicon Valley and South Silicon Valley because numbers are just exploding. Uh, but I think yeah, we, 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 the, the pace of development at, at really fastened. So, um, and the ecosystem is becoming more and more mature regarding early stages. So now, yeah, we have people that, that succeeded one, two, three times and that are ready to start new companies. What we still lack, I think, but that, that's probably a bit more even than, and, and not only a problem of Southern Europe, but rather Europe at all, is very large funds that allow for a series of C, D, and, and E with uh, tickets of the amount of 100 or 120 or over 200 million euros. Uh, for those kinds of investment, we still rely on North American funds. Uh, last year, for instance, in France, I think there were like five or six such, such deals. So it's, we still need more uh, large funds in order to, uh, to fuel uh, growth and uh, market traction. But now the number even of unicorns in France is growing and I, yeah, we're about 10 or 12 unicorns. So um, the ecosystem is really becoming more mature. 
And um, there is a strong support from the state also to go towards um, uh, bigger and bigger funds that could help fuel growth and things like that. So regarding the startup, the, the early stages, I think we're quite good, uh, quite mature. And now we are moving towards scale-ups and, and, and supporting companies really to grow, to access market and get large fundings to uh, expand internationally and be able to cope with international competition and especially from the US and China because companies in, in China also have huge fundings that, uh, that we cannot fight with. Okay. Very good. Uh, Xavier, in your case, uh, from your experience in Spain and also in the south of Europe, what difference do you feel that we have in front of the rest of Europe or, or other ecosystems? Uh, from an entrepreneur perspective, I, I fully agree with, with Robert. Uh, I think that the big difference uh, between uh, perhaps uh, in, in our case, Barcelona or, or Catalonia have in front of uh, other more mature uh, ecosystems is the amount of money that you can receive in the city state, you know, because sometimes uh, like an entrepreneur, you are thinking I have a uh, best product, I have uh, a more feature than other competitors in London, but they are receiving uh, five uh, millions of euros and I'm receiving one, no? for example. So this is an important difference when you are trying to start uh, your business. So I think this is a thing that it's, uh, solving uh, in the last times, but uh, it's, uh, we have to be honest that uh, uh, still is a difference, it's a big difference between uh, more mature or immature ecosystem. Uh, I think this is the, the unique thing because I think that we are changing our mentality and we are changing our uh, level of ambition and every day we are more closer uh, to other ecosystems because I think that we are living in a global uh, market and I think that perhaps the unique positive thing that it's uh, showing the COVID crisis, for example, is that uh, you can compete in any uh, point of the world if you have a good digital solution and you can jam some uh, theoretical barriers. But it's true that uh, we have to uh, build together the ecosystem to help uh, to business engines, accelerators, venture capitals to invest more money in the uh, city states in, in other ecosystems. Okay. Jacopo, in your point of view? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, south of Europe, like all of Europe, uh, is made up by a constellation of countries that have varied levels of maturity so i think there's a lot of things we could we could say uh, about you know the more mature countries like france for example and, and their ecosystem and, and and that makes it a little bit different when you want to compare it with maybe let's say greece and their ecosystem but but that acknowledging that um typically in south of europe we have uh, more fragmentation in the investor groups so Angel investing in many parts of, 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 let's say, Northern Europe or Central Europe is, is more coordinated through networks. And these networks are usually large and they're operating at a scale that is typically like region or multiple regions or, or even at the national level. And often in, in South of Europe, and, and again, don't take my remarks, uh, trying to label everyone as the same, but uh, the, we do see a lot more networks that operate at a, at a sub, let's say, uh, optimal scale. No, so they're smaller. They're very, they're very local in, in terms of the cities they're they're in, and and this actually isn't very helpful to generate an ecosystem at a national level. It actually causes only the creation of small hubs across the country that 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 travel at different speeds. Uh, so, so, and you kind of see that a little bit all over the map in the south of Europe. Um, another thing that, I mean, a lot of good stuff was mentioned, so I won't repeat it, but let's say that often in the south of Europe, we have legal and regulatory framework that doesn't really make it super comfortable and easy for a startup to operate. So, uh, besides uh, lots of bureaucracy and things like this and laws that can change uh, let's say a little bit more frequently than in other places let's say that 
uh, sometimes it's difficult to build a lean and flexible team structure in some parts of Europe. So, and that doesn't really help, to be honest. When you're a startup, you actually need your advantage is you're you're lean and flexible. So when you mm -hmm. want to take that away, that that's that's kind of like taking the shoe off of a runner and telling them to go run the marathon. So and then and then last but not least, I mean we do miss a lot having a real scale up venture capital industry in Europe. So the 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 bigger funds that invest from Series B, C, and and up. Uh, are kind of missing. They're a little bit more found in London and then those two, three mm -hmm. spots in Europe and, and not so much in the South. But thank goodness the governments are trying to fill that gap now more and more. And, and there's a good example, I think, in France. Uh, but, but there's also other decent examples of, of, of governments trying to intervene to incentivize this venture capital industry that we're kind of needing here in Europe. Following this line, Jacobo, uh... The exit plans. At the end of the day, we are playing this game because we want to help the startups to grow, to invest, and to have a return of investment. And also the accelerators are helping because they expect that at the end of this process, they will have a return of investment and the, the startups will grow. Uh, do you feel that there is a matter situation in the south of Europe for exit plans? Exit plans in two ways. It's uh, IPOs, and merchant acquisition. Yeah. And perhaps you can share your so, experience starting with you, Jacob. Yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, this is a problem that goes from north to south. Um, the main difference I would say is on the financial markets for IPOs, the north is slightly better than the south, simply because of the NASDAQ and their operation in Stockholm compared to other indexes uh, in the south of Europe, like, uh, you know, they're great, but but still sub subscale and small market. So um, the vast majority of exits actually happen with M&A. And usually it's a, either a, a corporation acquiring you or maybe a very big private equity fund acquiring you. But a lot, of the lion's share of the exits happen in that sense. We are actually starting to see more of a culture here in Europe of corporations that are not doing research and development in-house and they're doing it more with an open innovation way. And part of that exercise also ends up involving M&A transactions. Uh, we, we miss them quite a lot again here in Europe because we don't yet have the start uh, from a startup point of view, we don't yet have, I think enough uh, business relations with the corporates um, which would which would be the basic ingredient before finding the the M and A's. Uh, Xavier, in with your point of view, uh, do you feel the exit plans? Or at the end of the day, you 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 are in a very special situation because you are part of a, a business incubator or a, an accelerator related with a corporate. But this is not this is I feel that unique. It's not do I have a lot of them. What is your uh, point of view about the exit plans in the south of Europe? Uh, I fully agree with uh, Jacopo that it's not easy in Europe to, to get an IPO because uh, the, the context, the market and the regulation, it's complicated and the opportunities that you have. But it's true that for me, we have a huge opportunity in the merge and acquisition from uh, corporations. And, and I think we are a, a, a good example that uh, uh, I think that now in Europe and uh, more after the uh, COVID uh, crisis, the big corporations that have the, the need to be innovative. And sometimes they don't have uh, the knowledge to uh, be innovative inside of the big corporations. So they are looking for opportunities outside of uh, their uh, barriers. So there we have a, a, a big opportunity. And for example, we are a good example because we have uh, internal startup inside a big corporation, but they are understanding that they don't can't uh, control that uh, uh, new venture, that they uh, have to get us freedom to uh, iterate, to learn, and to try to scale the, the business. So uh, I think in that case, in Europe, we have a great opportunity, but because I have the feeling that for first time, a lot of companies are uh, looking and scouting for uh, startups that can improve the core business of uh, uh, the companies. From the entrepreneur perspective, it's very important to understand that we have to connect 
with the core business of the big corporations, okay? Because it's not only about to, okay, you big company, you have to be innovative. No, no, how you, how I can help you to improve your p &L? Uh, how uh, can I improve your uh, uh, incomes in the future if we are creating new revenue streams? So I think that we have to change this mentality. And in this sense, I think that we have a, a huge opportunity. In your case, Robert, uh, the idea of exit plans, how are you managing this? Uh, because at the end of the day, you are an accelerator mm -hmm. and you are a connector uh, with, with the startups and not only investors, also some companies. I don't know if you have a ma you are relate you have relation. More than that, do you have a you are a shareholder or are you a shareholder of the startups or just you help them and you have a success fee also in order to understand your <laughs> business model and incentive? And we are uh, so we are a fee for service uh, accelerator. So we help them, and, and we can pay for that because we think, uh, yeah, we, as we, are, yeah, we think it's the right model for us. Um, so about exits, no. One thing that was very interesting is that once I, I find a study about exits, so French corporates buying French startups versus French corporate buying uh, U.S. startups or North American startups, and um, and what we see is that they pay a higher price. They're they are okay to pay a higher price to buy a North American startup versus a French startup. Although they are kind of at, at the same stage, same level, uh, same development. Um, and it's, uh, and, and yeah, North American companies buy French startups at a higher price than French companies. So we are still, I think European uh, corporates still have to uh, understand the value of incorporating startups and play the game also play the role also because if, if there is nothing in the end, and if all European startups, whether they are from South or North America or North Europe, are bought by Chinese or North American companies or wherever they are, uh, then we lose something. Mean, we lose most of the value, and we lose everything. And innovation won't be in Europe, but in other countries. So I think we still miss um, something at the end of the road in terms of M and A. Um, but then, yes, what we what we advise to start is is talk. Uh, as early as possible to corporates, but uh, but not too early either because uh, they need to be prepared and corporates can lose you in endless discussions because they are so big and they have so many people that everyone asks you to repeat and repeat and repeat over again the same things. So they have to be prepared again when they talk with, with corporates and know exactly why they go and meet with them. Uh, so is it for partnership? Is it for co-development? Is it uh, for sales? Um, and then, eat for the um, aim for the right person also because uh, as far as yeah, we can lose really a lot of time discussing with the wrong person very good because it seems that we have now we started one hour ago <laughs> the, the idea to understand the animals that we had in the in our zoo in our uh, ecosystem of innovation entrepreneurs uh, investors and accelerators and uh, we understood very well how important it is to fall in love with the problem that Xavier told us at the beginning. If we don't have really a problem, it's better not to start. If we don't have a big problem, it's better not to start because if not, we will not find market. It means we will not find people that will invest in us. Following the idea of uh, Jacopo, uh, that at the end of the day, they are investing in people. They are investing, uh, helping them with smart money, with also mentoring and providing uh, all the experience of, of these people, uh, they will not waste time in projects and not only money, money and time <laughs> in projects that cannot grow. And also following the ideas of uh, Robert that he was uh, very interesting, that the idea of accelerator, how we take advantage of the experience. And I was uh, enjoying a lot your expression, Robert, about you will never be alone. Uh, uh, it means that you you are not alone as an entrepreneur because sometimes the entrepreneur, the team is alone mm -hmm. in front of a new project. But the experience of the project is the same: is you know, checking the market, trying to find uh, customers, developing the prototype, and after that to find investors and really taking advantage of people. That as you, Robert, you are doing that. It's uh, the best way to growth, and also keyword in all of that time. I, I, uh, I remember a, a key word uh, of uh, Jory Engel, 
professor from UC Berkeley, that when he's talking about innovation, innovation is not just the word that you can read here. Innovation on the other side is time, speed, speed, speed. And speed means to work and to uh, fast, but in the, in the right way. And that's the reason why I feel when we create this ecosystem of a scale up, because I didn't read this spread, uh, this European project is focusing on that, how to scale up, we discover what you are telling at the end of this presentation. The scale up means that you have to think about the exit plan. And if we know that in North of Europe, or South of Europe, we have the IPOs as the exit plan, the only IPO is the corporate, the corporate innovation, the corporate entrepreneurship. But this is not only good for startups, it's also good for corporates or also uh, small and medium companies with a, a dimension because at the end of the day, they will find in the startups the source of innovation because they will not do any disruptive innovation. They cannot do. Uh, we had another webinar talking about that. The traditional corporates, they really uh, don't have, they, don't, they cannot put 1,000 people uh, think about what's next. What they can read is 1,000 startups analyzing what's next and trying to connect and to develop this kind of accelerators or incubators related with that. Good. I feel that we had a wonderful webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much, Jacob and Xavier. Uh, I was trying to manage uh, in terms of time, uh, but in any case, we remember you. Uh, that we have our uh, next uh, webinars, you, you can find uh, not only webinars, all the activities in the scaleupchampion.com. This is our, web, uh, our website. Very happy to help entrepreneurs in Europe. I'm very happy to have you, Jacopo, Roberto, and Xavier today, because we're learning a little more. Thinking about the scale up means exit plans. Exit plans means corporates opening the door of innovation. Thank you very much. We are in touch and see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.